Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Mackie. I'm Sid. That's Sid. And I'm Sid's dad, Jim. We are doing another Q&A episode. We've done one before with our coach, um, with Lee McCormack. Try to get interesting people who have fun and important things to share for mountain bikers. So we are bringing my dad on because he was a nurse for 40 years? 30, yeah. 30 years in the ER, he was a paramedic, and he's been a mountain biker for years, so he's dealt with all sorts of mountain biking injuries. So today we're gonna talk first aid. <laughs> How long have you been mountain biking, Jim? Um, you know, the first I heard of mountain biking was the guys in San Francisco dropping off of um, Mount Tamalpais. Mount Tamalpais, yeah. and we started riding single speed Schwinns through the through the back part of the property we were living on. I would say the first time I ever recall going through the woods on or going through a terrain that wasn't a road was probably 1974. As a quick side note, Jim is very good on a mountain bike. And if you haven't seen the video of Sid riding with her parents in Glorietta, we will link to that so you guys can check that one out. As a side note, I'd like to say that I'm a better mountain biker because of these two. <laughs> I've learned a great deal from them. For these Q&A episodes, we put up a post on our Patreon so that our patrons can leave questions for the people that we're interviewing. So if you want to get in on, on that, head over to Patreon. We'll just jump into these questions. You ready? I'm ready. Fire away. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Dean. Okay, this is two questions. We'll start with, what do you carry? And does that change if you're going out by yourself, say in the back country, or going out with a group of people? The thing I carry... <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> Visual. Um, the thing I always carry, and I try to keep a bunch in my pack, are bandanas. If you get used to the fact that you always carry two of these, you can always wipe your nose and you can always stop bleeding. You have the ability to tie things tight. You have all kinds of options. Let me just show you a quick thing with bandanas that make them even that much more useful. But we all know that the band, a good bandana is fairly good size and it, it's about that square. If you go corner to corner and you get your um, thing like that and you roll it from this position, you come up with a pretty strong tie down. So you can put that on over any kind of laceration and if you've got the ability to go twice, you can put a little torque on it and, and square knots, learn to tie a square knot. Um, we, I've used this on myself with a good rock crush to the shin. Um, it really works well if you, you know, and I, I would say that's probably one of the mountain bikers' most common injuries yeah, is getting getting shins because we protect our knees and our ankles. But if you can put that on and then pull your sock off, you know, you'll finish the race, you'll finish the day, you know, and and a little pressure on an open wound helps it, the pain, reduces the pain. So that's just a good thing. And if you do multiples of these, you can actually tie them to a stick to help immobilization, so covers up be... abrasions, stops bleedings, will we'll tie off an artery, will uh, do a tourniquet, all that kind of stuff. And I know you've also, I know that you have used, say, a bike tube in the past. I do. To, what do you do? And everybody that? generally carries a bike tube, but bike tube is a phenomenal sling. Mm -hmm. It's also a good tie back. And one of the things you want to do to ease a little bit of pain, the most common injury with bicycles is sticking out your mm -hmm. hand when you're going down. The collarbone. And the collarbone's the most fragile point, so it cracks. Well, when the collarbone's rubbing together while you're moving, that hurts. So if you can get the guy in this position so that both shoulders are back, and an inner tube can help a lot with that. And just go around like this, and you get the one part of the arm in there and the other part of the arm in like this, and there's your sling. And this is great for shoulders, number two injury, clavicles, good there. Um, this may be more comfortable than a pullback on somebody if their clavicle is just uh, fractured and not separated. Um, you know, if you want to, you could even put air in this and it shortens it up a little bit. You can That's put, clever. You can put a fun. bandana or you can stuff a lot of stuff up behind the, the neck 
to, for comfort and it also rises. Make sure your valve isn't digging them in the neck and you've got a perfect sling there for, and then the next step is, let's get this person up. You know, are you lightheaded at all? Are you having any problem? Does that make you crazy? I mean, <laughs> okay. lightheaded? Okay, yeah, perfect. if they do get lightheaded, <laughs> sit them right back down. I've sat them in the middle of the trail, turned them around, put their feet in the air because Sometimes you just have a neurological reaction to an injury like that that causes all your blood to go to the wrong places. <laughs> so just turn them around, get their feet up in the air a little bit, and then try again. Again, this is not somebody where, you know, they did that, and we all do that. Um, the, the other element of, of doing this to try and get a little bit, go ahead and stand up and turn around. It's, it's a similar thing, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna tie them up like that and like this. So we'll actually bring that down and that down and see how that forces her shoulders back. Yeah. If this, if the clavicle is separated, that'll pull the two clavicle bones apart. And it'd be more comfortable. And give her the ability to get out. Okay. Cool. These are the kind of injuries you need to walk out with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're a pretty tough clan and we can tolerate a lot of pain. So we've got to remember that we can't expect people because we've got a minor upper extremity injury to come in and get us out so yeah, we your got, legs work you walk you're right <laughs> yeah, i like that and we'll get into stuff about like situations where maybe you shouldn't walk later yeah for sure. um first let's show what mackie and i carry we have a first aid kit from adventure medical kits this i would say and we discussed this with my dad earlier is is much more for like very minor injuries what he's talking about, like making a tourniquet or like stopping the bleeding, like you're probably better off with a bandana. One of the things that all of these have is sterile and no one should under as, underrate the, the nice aspect of using sterile products on an open body. Yeah. Um, so th you carry this, you've got sterile products, you can put the sterile product on first and then um, you can put the bandana on over top of that. Exactly. Some sterile stuff. And Moleskin, this is just something like this isn't really first aid, but like we do a lot of hike a bike and enduro races. So having something to put on blisters yep. is awesome. Yep. Not a bad thing to carry. Not really first aid. You, you can walk out. And, with the and you know, this but. is really good too for just rub points. So mm -hmm. anytime you, you know, you're carrying a heavy pack because yep. you're packing a lot of winter gear. Um, just putting it on that point where it's rubbing before it gets irritated works well. Don't put mole skin on already open skin. Yep. It'll hurt. <laughs> so, it so anyway, basically these little first aid kits just have very basic stuff for patching up minor wounds. Yeah, let's or, just show real quick what's in there. So there's yeah, some mole skin, for blisters, there's some butterfly band-aids. We would probably not use these on the trail we would wait till we got somewhere where we could really clean up first good right? advice um but these sort of things that are just what are these called sterile bandages two by twos or four by fours okay. this They're is just all, stop, you know, stops bleeding there's only the only stuff. thing you really want to sort of check out in any of that is whether it's stick versus non-stick because yeah. some of the four by four fibrous stuff is just there to absorb blood but if you put that right on the wound, it absorbs later. into mm -hmm. the wound, and when it dries, it's a little bit harder to get <laughs> off. These yeah. are like those ones are non-adherent pads. Yeah. Non-stick, non yeah, non-adherent. So that's good. Perfect. That's anyway, your perfect first layer. This sort of stuff is just—it's a bandana. That's a bandana. It's yep. a wrap. Only sterile. But yeah. really, <laughs> I think your point with the bandanas is. The trail is not a sterile environment and it's not going to be. And you're not anything you do on the trail side is not the final product for a wound. Yeah. You know, like yeah. even if you do have all this stuff, you still want to clean it better when you get back to yeah. the house or, all we or you might need the, to go get stitches. Yeah. Yeah. All you want to do on the trail is cover it up and stop bleeding. Yep. And then we also have some we've got ibuprofen, probably not necessary. Um Diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Benadryl has saved Mackie's life. So <laughs> Benadryl is a good thing to have around. Yeah. Um, Be careful who you reactions. give anybody a pill. Uh, yeah. If you're giving yeah. out medication, you don't have the right to prescribe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you. you really ask have them. To, yeah. yeah. Though I don't if know. They if, someone, want, if I come across someone who's having an let them take shock, it. I'll give Say, them Say, hey, Benadryl. if you want Benadryl, I've got Benadryl. And yeah. that's not a bad thing to carry. That yeah. is one of the few things. I and do. given that I am deathly allergic to wasps, um, I carry an EpiPen, so, you know, so we personally have an EpiPen and Benadryl 
with us all the time. And then this first aid kit has more Benadryl, some aspirin, some other pain meds, like little things like that. I think there's some sterile alcohol wipes in there, like in here, yeah. some things like that. Tweezers. So. Tweezers, yeah. Don't underrate a tweezer because <laughs> if you've ever had a splinter in the wrong place, it works on just about everything but the eye. Do not, <laughs> not use tweezers not on use anything tweezers on in the eye. eye. Okay. okay. We also have a wet wipe. You want to show the wet wipe there? Sid? This is just, I don't know what this is for, but you know what, you never know yeah. until you need it. Again, it's, We've used it's them. clean it up, cover it up, <laughs> yep. and get home. Exactly. If, you know, if it you, could also be toilet paper in a severe emergency. There you <laughs> go, there you go. <laughs> That's Sorry. not a bad kit to carry on an everyday bike ride. It's super light, so Yeah, nice. and, and it gives you a wipe. lot of um, help for other people. Mm -hmm. so. so I think, to get back to the original question, it was, I think, sort of directed at like, how do you view riding by yourself versus riding with a bunch of people? Do you come more prepared for one of those things or? I tend to be, I tend to carry more and prepare better for a group ride. Mm -hmm. And- Cause you don't know what people on the group are gonna do. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think all of us, ha you know, on our group rides, we'll see somebody out there by themselves and in, and we all ride by ourselves because, mm -hmm. doggone it, we don't get enough riding as it is. And I think you really need to develop two different styles of riding. And, and you would say that's more important than, like, what you bring, carry. how you if ride. If you're a riding alone, there's a pretty good chance you can't help yourself. And if you can't help yourself, the only thing you can do is pre-prepare. And there's two things you can pre-prepare by telling somebody where you are. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're going to be back. And when, when you're going to be and back. And where you're going. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and even more importantly than when you're going to be back, because we all know that fifth flat tire we yeah. had really gets everybody freaked <laughs> out. And really, we're not having a bad time. It's just that the mechanicals slow us down. And so you don't want to panic people when you're 25 minutes late. But the, the thing you do want to do is when you're out there by yourself, develop a different style of riding. Mm -hmm. There's the style of riding you do when you're with your Yahoo friends, mm -hmm. okay? Like my stuff I do with you two, I know you guys are going to cover me and help me out if I blow it. Um, when I'm by myself, I have what my friends and I have always called West Virginia style riding, <laughs> which is you're six hours from any kind of help. So you have to behave a little bit differently. You can't afford to make a big mistake. Mm -hmm. And so when you're riding by yourself, whatever you call it, whatever that secondary style of riding is, do it differently. And that's also true riding in the backcountry, which we do a lot. Like even if you're with people, if it's six hours to get out. Yeah. Well, smart. that's why we call it West Virginia, because in the east, you know, there are parts of West Virginia where it's going to take a minimum of six hours to get help to you. Yeah. Not get you out. Not get yeah. you out. And yeah. that, that means you got enough friends that one stays with you and, the, and, and one maybe helps build a fire and one goes off to get help. And you know what that means. You're three hours into the woods. It takes him three hours to get out to a point where he can even get a cell connection. And then the first responders get organized and you got to move yeah. in. And I think this, we had a question from Todd that says, more and more people are going on epic rides in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, I've seen many people nearly die because they're not prepared. What gear, first aid gear would you recommend? I think we've kind of answered that, is that the first thing that we recommend is changing the way that you ride and being very smart and being conscious of the fact that you're in the middle of nowhere. Because I think something we don't often realize is like, oh, it took us two hours to get up this climb on a mountain bike as a fit person. That's not the same as someone coming up with a backboard, you know, yeah. like that's going to take them yeah. a lot longer. And that's assuming you have cell service to call like you're. So I think it, it just yeah. being aware of the fact of how long it actually could take to, like you said, not just get someone not just get you out, but get someone to you. The the gear you recommend is basically something to stop massive amounts of bleeding in some way, which is the bicycle tube that we all carry, which yeah. is to make a splint or brace or something that allows yeah. you to walk out with an upper yep. extremity. Warm clothing. Um, one of the things I carry is mm. one of these REI plastic um, rescue uh, blankets, you know, I keep we one of We have those little emergency yeah, for, things. Yeah, for our those big rides. Well, we haven't been Because, here. again, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're so small and they're so easy that mm -hmm. I just generally, in every hydration pack I have, I have one stuck in there. You're probably not going to save somebody's life with this. You're going to mm -hmm. save it with this or this. Mm -hmm. Like, you're going to be able to call out or you're not. 
and you're gonna be able to stop bleeding or you're not. And anything beyond that, you're gonna keep the person warm for what could be hours and hours and hours. Well, and, and that's, that's the your... big thing. If they don't move, you don't move them. Mm -hmm. So you've got to figure out a way to keep them warm. And if they're alert, uh, somewhat, you know, comfortable as much as possible. And I think that that gets into the second half of Dean's question. He said, is there anything you would not suggest for an untrained person? I'm gonna guess there's a lot of things. Yeah. Not <laughs> yeah. Open heart surgery. Yeah. <laughs> like... I think the thing is, is get trained. Get some information, basic first aid, solo, whatever, whatever program you want to go through. But get some training, you know, or make sure somebody in your group's got training and don't exceed the limits of what you know. And don't move someone. Who yeah, if they don't move, move, don't move them. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's really critical. But if they move, let's get them out ourselves. Mm -hmm. This is something that people worry about a lot with mountain biking is spinal injuries and like maybe someone walking off who has a spinal injury because the adrenaline is so high. What are the, the, if you could think like three things that you should not let someone move if? If they can't move a part of their body, they should not move okay. at all. So any if, sort of numbness, Any tingling. kind of, well, numbness and tingling can go along with um, anxiety and, and a few other things. Hitting the ground so, hard. <laughs> you know, you, you might want to give it a little bit of time and, but, you know the thing is is you just keep saying can you move your feet can you can you bend your knees can you you know can you can you roll over can you do these things anytime the answer is no it's don't move them okay. at all ems would of course you know if they're in the in the vehicle or in a car or in a crash site they're not going to let them move right but our situation's a little bit yeah. different we've got a we were we're working with people we know or people we know why they're out there mm -hmm. and, and you're you're far out there yeah, so the benefits of moving might be better than yeah. sitting there for well i mean and... there are doc there are documented cases of spinal injuries where people when they moved displace the spinal yeah. and you know cord so there's always that but you can't look at everybody and say don't move right. you know until we get an ambulance and t you know to carry somebody out on a stretcher without the rescue equipment that they have on these mountain venues mm -hmm. is a lot of work. Yeah. So um, most EMSs that aren't in you know high uh, are areas of of high play, mm -hmm. call them what you want, don't have the carts with the wheels on them. So they're going to be carrying you out on a stoke stretcher, and that's a minimum of six men, six women, six strong people. That's a lot of work. Yeah. This, I think, is a really good question from April. If you are solo on the trail and hit your head, what kind of self-check can you do to assess whether you have a concussion? And I think this is actually relevant whether you're solo or not. But how do you know after you hit your head if you're good to go or not? You don't. Yeah. Um, the answer is short. If, if you wake up on the trail, you've had a concussion. concussion. <laughs> okay. if, if you can't remember what happened, you've had a concussion. If you have blurry vision if you have blurry vision numbness and tingling you've concussed yourself maybe compressed your spine um, if you're gonna ride solo you know there's really no way to do a self-assessment yeah as far as head injuries are concerned <clears throat> so the probably the best way to decide whether you've got a concussion or not on your own is take your helmet off put a thumb on each side of that helmet and pull it apart as hard as you can if it's got a crack in it, you you've, you've had a serious head injury. And Go so probably hospital. regardless, <laughs> if you're on your own and you hit your head, your best policy is to get yourself out as quickly and safely as possible. And it then is. get and checked feel, out. Right, and then get checked out. But if you feel like you're dizzy enough that you can't ride, then you probably need to call for help if that's an option. If or that's you need to walk. yeah. Again, this yeah. is goes back to our discussion about riding alone. You have to ride differently, mm -hmm. and but anything can happen. <laughs> you know, falling off a rock, mm -hmm. it happens so fast. So, if you've injured yourself and you can get up and walk out, get up and walk Leave out. Leave your bike in the bushes and walk. Well, you know, so, you yeah. Who who among us would do that? <laughs> <laughs> and the bike isn't often a bad thing to lean on. That's and true. If, you know yeah. so. None of us are going to leave our bikes behind. I mean, so but. let's say that you're you're not riding alone. You're riding with a friend. Your friend crashes and hits their head. 
you watch it, you think it looks bad, they say they're fine. This is something that has happened, I think, to everyone who has ridden a mountain bike. We've all been with people who have hit their heads and claim they're they fine. fine. I've done it. Mm-hmm. I've, yes. I've had two friends say, we need to take you to the hospital, mm-hmm. and I refuse to go. Um, <laughs> that's partly because I know what's going to happen to me in the hospital. So um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what's going to happen to you in the hospital, you, if you've concussed yourself, you probably need to have somebody evaluate you who's mm-hmm. a professional. And things have changed about head injuries over the year. We, we One of the nice things about football right now is that they are paying attention mm-hmm. to head injuries. And they do know that multiple head injuries in a row is a really bad thing. Mm-hmm. Or not slowing down for a period of time after a head injury is a bad thing. The best thing you can do is get professional evaluation. Sorry, it's going to cost you. It's going to take some time. But, um, but you know it's more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Being a vegetable. <laughs> Tony asks, is it worth taking an advanced first aid class? What type of class would you recommend? Knowles offers a specific wilderness specific class. Is that what I, I did the solo. Yeah, 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 you did. Yeah, I did a woofer, which is wilderness first responder, which is a 10 day course. And I, w- I love doing that. It was super fun yeah. and interesting. I, I mean, I wouldn't say, I think, you need to recognize it doesn't really qualify you to do you don't know everything the answer to the question is yes yes let's say that all of us should have a little bit of first aid knowledge (laughs) um you know some people say a little knowledge is a bad thing i'm not so sure it is in this situation i think having some knowledge of what an emergency is Mm -hmm. is critical the thing that they really stressed in the wilderness first responder course is that you your first priority is like to secure the situation to make sure that everyone else is safe so you don't go running in and and this is sort of aimed i think at like avalanche kind of things which is not what you Mm -hmm. see on a mountain bike but there's still or sharp corners and trails where the first guy goes off right the second guy goes (laughs) off the third guy goes we've all seen that video (laughs) so stop the thing before it gets worse right so in a race situation that you you're the best thing you might be to do is to walk around the corner and stop oncoming racers Okay, so another part of this question wants to know if you would suggest carrying a tourniquet or are they more dangerous than helpful? We actually got this question from two people. Um, And I think in a way your bandanas are serving as a tourniquet, but I know that's something that I think people have heard a lot that like if you cut off blood flow for too long, the limb might have to be amputated or something. The science, so tourniquets are scary, yeah. the basically. science on tourniquets has changed a lot with the Afghan war. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll just be real honest with you. A, the IEDs and the limb losses and stuff, they have just become ruthless about tur- putting tourniquets on. If you have uncontrollable bleeding, you have got to put a tourniquet on. Okay. These are very serious injuries. Mm-hmm. And they're not likely on m- mountain bike injuries for, unless you're dealing with a bear, a bear attack or, you know, where, you know, we're dealing with deep, uh, vascular large artery uh, cuts. We have seen, there have been multiple YouTube videos of people on bikes cutting. Their yeah, yeah. Artery. Okay. But All that right. wouldn't be a tourniquet, right? That would just be direct pressure because we would even put the tourniquet. Correct. There. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. tourniquet tends to be, you know, um, you know, one. It's direct pressure, elevation. You, you try, know, everything, you try else everything else first. Okay. first. It's a tough decision to make because. Technically, when you put a tourniquet on, everything from that point on is gone. Wow. You know, you you, you so you, you shouldn't kind of, do it except. I'm never I mean, going to say you should. Well, you you, you know, shouldn't accept as a last resort, yeah. basically. Yeah. You're just that's exactly what yeah. it is. Okay. It's a last resort. The second part of the question was how about the clotting agents, which I know we have several of in our big medical kit. Is that something you carry in your pack? I do not, yeah. um, and mostly those. Uh, are just to stop oozing, from from what I understand. Uh, I know there are huge pads that they put on that they yeah, issue. One in, in yeah, they kit, issue yeah. that stop, you know, are really good at stopping bleeding, capillary bleeding for the most part. You're not going to stop arterial bleeding, bleeding. Okay. Yeah, with a little bitty bit of powder or a little bandage. Um, but but I do know they have huge packs that they put on that have. Um, you know, a medicine in them that stops bleeding. So this is a question that I think is maybe a little out of your wheelhouse, but Steve asks, I've come across several rattlesnakes when out riding. I almost ran right over one in the middle of the trail a month ago. Do snake bite kits work? What kind of first aid would you use for a snake bite? You know, 
We have copperheads in the east, and I've been looking for a rattlesnake the whole time I've been out here. But I, you know, I sort of view snakes as something that you, you know where they live and you try to avoid contact with them. If you're hit by a copperhead in southern Ohio, there's a pretty good chance that the first hit is a dry bite. If you get hit twice, you're gonna be in trouble. We have, you know, a friend of ours, that's his, his thing, and maybe we should refer that question yeah, to him we'll, if, if we can move we'll, that on We'll down. follow up on that in yeah, the comments yeah. if we can. So our last question here from Reactive Mountain Biking, interested in the um, official basic kit that would work for group rides and to keep with him while using a big pack on long rides. I think this thing's awesome. It's super lightweight, easy. Um, Venture medical kits. This is the 0.5. I think they have a 0.7 if you want a little bit more stuff. Um, you can get them on Amazon for I think like $15. So, and then we have this guy which we keep in the van um, because it's huge. And this is sort of clean up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's either like we can do sort of like a final thing, which we'll put in a little cleanup we did on Mackie's, Mackie's <laughs> leg. He was kind enough to get injured for this video. <laughs> I just can't believe how many people are willing to have tattoos. Well, I think scars are just tattoos with a good story. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm not one to run off to the ER to fix every laceration. Yeah. But if you get those lacerations closed as much as you can, and that's Which where the, the steri strips, strips and good cleaning, clean, so yeah, good cleaning. Infection makes scars worse. Yeah, and one of those, <laughs> among yeah, other things. among <laughs> other things. <laughs> um, I, you know, I go to the grocery store and buy a six pack of, of sponges, uh -huh. and I just keep them in the in the van all the time. And you, if you've got sterile water, you've got really clean water. The sooner you scrub out a laceration, the less likely it is to get infected. And you know, a clean sponge that's never been used, don't use your dish sponge <laughs> or your bathroom cleaning sponge. You know, use a brand new clean sponge and that's- And then throw it away. Yeah, and then- so, Something like this to ride with, a yep. bandana. And uh, bandanas I love, yeah. Bleeding, some yep. a little bit more in your car. So this is one question, this is something you can't really be prepared for as we learned with Mackie's allergy, um, someone having a really bad allergic reaction, probably to a bee on a bike ride. I suppose you could accidentally eat a peanut or something. But, <laughs> um, would you recommend if you're on like big backcountry group rides, I know like official groups usually have epinephrine. Is that something you would carry or recommend? If you know and you are comfortable using it, like Mackie, yeah. you know, he knows he's gonna use it on himself. Yeah, I would uh, not hesitate to use it on somebody because yeah. Epi is going to give you a, a a strange feeling for a while. But if you have a known allergy to um, you know bee stings, it's probably you know it's probably better you get that. Right. Or, you know, the question bee. though is the unknown allergies because yeah. when he had an allergic reaction, he had never had one before, and you were 25. So um, in that happen. situation, if you're a long way from help, um, you knew he was in trouble. Yeah. Okay. And he, if you know he's got a pen, or his friend's got a pen, or he's got a pen, and he and you guys are watching this happen, yeah. uh, if somebody starts getting hard, it's hard to breathe. They're getting swelling, and mm -hmm. they're they're they can't. Their voices change. Their voice is changing because their the area in around the voice box is swelling, mm -hmm. and that's really really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, face it we can talk about snake bites all we want but the yellow jackets kill more people yep. way more people if you're knowledgeable and have your own EpiPen and you see somebody in trouble again the ramifications of not doing it are greater than the mm -hmm. ramifications of doing it so is that something you would recommend that people who want to be prepared or do a lot of group rides carry with them even if they themselves do not have an allergy um, carrying an EpiPen is really hard. You have to get a prescription right, for it. Yeah. And so the few times I've gone on large group rides, I've carried a few things that I got doctor's permission to carry, mm -hmm. and EpiPens w was one. Mm -hmm. But as a nurse, I'm trained to do it. Would I recommend the general public go out and buy an EpiPen? They couldn't. Yeah. And now they've become so prohibitively expensive yeah. that you can't carry one. So. The things to do are, you know, the Benadryl is a great idea. Yeah. Ellen always carries Benadryl. I never think to. That know? was what I was going to say is through this process of finding out that I'm definitely allergic to bees and almost dying once, I found out that it's it's the Benadryl that saves you. Like the epinephrine opens up your airways and, and keeps you from dying, but the Benadryl is what stops the reaction. Since then, when I've gotten stung, I actually do Benadryl first 
and then like lie down and relax and usually that takes care of the reaction I'm good to go it's only if I don't do the Benadryl and I wait too long that I have to epi myself and epinephrine sucks and makes you feel terrible so try not to do that like always have Benadryl because it's I mean you, the packets like yeah. this big it's super easy to carry always have that with you if somebody gets stung by something especially if they know they have a reaction but either way just give have them take two Benadryl like they're gonna be a little bit yeah. drowsy it's not a big deal if anyone has any reaction to a bee sting like hives anywhere give Benadryl. Them Benadryl yeah and if you oh. open up your pack and it expired three years ago give it anyway give it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because generally that doesn't mean a thing but I've I've and, seen people oh this is expired we can't use it no use it yeah it'll be fine and also like you can get a bee allergy when you haven't had one before yeah. that's what we learned that's what i didn't know Mackie was going into anaphylactic shock and i was saying but you're not allergic to bees <laughs> so the moral of the story there is if someone's having a reaction they are allergic even if they weren't before so even if they're saying i'm not allergic to bees if they're getting hives, drill. <laughs> especially if they're getting hives places where the sting wasn't mm -hmm. like any sort of systemic reaction start with the benadryl and then get the hell out of there again this is all about situational awareness mm -hmm. the bee sting you knew happened you don't have to get the guy all excited because he got a bee sting but keep an eye on him mm -hmm. don't just get back on your bikes and ride away i think that concludes our questions um is there anything you want to add or what's the like number one piece of advice you would give people watching this video other than carry a tube and a bandana <laughs> you know from my experience both in the ER and in the field, situational awareness is probably the most critical aspect of being able to respond to an emergency. If you don't pay attention to what's going on around you, you're going to make mistakes that are, that are going to get you injured. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're riding down the trail, you're not just paying attention to that track or to your cardiac rate or to your, your, <laughs> your torque or your... You, you, you want to pay attention to everything that's going on. If that bear is coming at you or that bear is going away. <laughs> um, if that moose is coming at you or the moose yeah. is going away. Uh, all of that situational awareness, I think, is critical in every element of our day. Get rid of the headphones. Get rid of, um, you know, if the data it overpowers you in the woods, when you're riding alone, get rid of it. Um, you know, or, or track it with, put tape over it, whatever it takes for you not to pay attention to it. Telephones and cell phones, you know, I'm sorry, we've had so many injuries right on the bike path in front of the hospital because people are looking at their cell phones. They just fall over. So wear a helmet, wear pads where it's important. Be aware of your situation. Mackie was kind enough to let a rock come up and womp him in the shin pretty good. So we get to give you a real life tutorial to go along with the Q&A. And here we go. We got Mackie. We got my dad. I'm sorry. We got I'm our to have a head on. first aid kit. <laughs> and we have the wound. Ooh. Gross. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. We're going to basically show you what to do for minor cuts that are also just a little deep enough that maybe you don't want to leave them alone entirely. So maybe we could talk about how you how you know when you should do something to a cut and when you can just ignore it. Well, if it's bleeding and it won't stop, you need to do something. Okay. And this and one's been bleeding a lot. So. Yeah. It's been bleeding and for like four hours yeah. now. A bleeding wound is not a bad wound. It, it actually cleans itself a little bit. This one you can see is gapped. So uh, if you were working on somebody you didn't know and you, you, you probably should work with some kind of gloves on. So recommended gloves for doing any kind of work on somebody you don't know are these blue uh, uh, nitrate gloves or latex gloves. It's got a pretty good gap on it. And you can see the blood is can, you know is beginning to ooze again and so what we're going to do is try and 
pinch it together and let me see what I can do. And what you've already done is he scrubbed it out really good. Right. He scrubbed it in the stream because we're out in the woods. With a sponge. Yeah, with a lot. You know, off some of the hair. Yeah. One of the things we we do is is keep an abundance of just brand new uh, sponges around. Sterile environment. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You do the best you can. And this is a really classic example. And here are the, is the standard shop towel, you know, (laughs) and he dried it off with it real good. And the next step is we're going to pull from the pine needles on the, on the on the table, a steri strip, and the steri strips are really cool because they just do this, and by taking that backing off, it gives you the ability to plant all of them on one side, and and I've already wiped this off pretty well with alcohol, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push this together. Okay, so now I'm getting a pretty good pull on it, and I'm going to push it down and I've got a pretty nice seal and you don't have to worry about it if they're perfectly straight the idea now is for them never to be taken off until they fall off so you know with his activity over the next couple days it's going to be they're going to fall off pretty quick (laughs) actually (laughs) but if you were at home and you were going to keep your foot up for a little while it would be fine now that's just the beginning of the dressing that holds it together so then we want to go with with something that's really a, a sterile dressing and these are pretty nice because they're going to fit the right size you know it, the objective of a band-aid is to try not to s- touch the sterile side but again you know we're out here in the woods do what you can yeah do what you can and this one is sort of a perfect size so we'll just put that right on like that a little bit of blood oozed out we don't care I mean, you know, it really doesn't matter. Now, we'll leave that on overnight. Um, If I change it in the morning, what I'll do is just take the top dressing off, leave the steri strips in place, put a new one on, and maybe tomorrow before he races, we'll put a little bit extra ramp on there. The one thing you want to remember is if your gloves are really, really dirty, you want to minimize, (laughs) you know, so you take your cleanest finger, cleanest thumb, and you put it under there, and you pull that one inside out and stuff it in like that, and then this one will come right up and over, and there's a pair of really dirty gloves that you can throw out. And cool. you've got a minimal on your hands, but anytime you put on rubber gloves, you wash your hands before and you wash your hands after you take them off. Mackie and I have used these Steri strips many times. They are very handy. They make things like that heal so much faster than just leaving it alone, which I know is what most mountain bikers <laughs> do. But Steri strips, yeah. Fast healing, not stitches, cheap, pretty much good all-around solution. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope this was helpful. If you have additional questions, put them in the comments, and we'll try to get back to you. In the meantime, be more awesome. It's been a pleasure.